Oh yeah, yeah. At its core, Lucky's Tale is a story of greed and vengeance. <laughs> this week on Backward Compatible, the crew is joined by Phil Johnson of Playful Corp to discuss Lucky's Tale for Oculus Rift and the challenges of developing for virtual reality. Plus, impressions of super hot pixel starships and punch out for we. Compatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 65 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, Games and New Media with a Splash of Academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hello, everybody. And we're joined by Doc. Hi, how's it going? And we have a returning guest today, Phil Johnson. What up? And uh, Phil is in today to talk to us a little bit about uh, Lucky's Tale, a uh, game that has been released by Playful Corp, a local studio, and they... Uh, They've also been, Lucky's Tale is being distributed with every copy of the Oculus Rift, so that's kind of a big deal. Uh, but Phil is in a... The Oculus Rift, for those that don't know, it's virtual reality. It's Tron. It's <laughs> like real reality, but better. It's no, we virtual. are VR yeah. troopers. <laughs> virtual reality. What? Oh, now I've got uh, that song stuck on my head. Thanks, Phil. You're welcome. That's, uh, that's actually the least the, uh, worst song I could throw at you right now. Oh. <laughs> but we're going to be talking well, a little bit Well, thank uh, you in that case. Yes. But we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, Lucky's Tale and about developing it and some of the challenges of working with VR in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, but first, we have a few opening segments for you, including the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. Recently, I picked up on the cheap a, about a $7 copy of uh, Punch-Out! Wii, a game that I kind of missed out on the first time around. Mm. Um, and... It feels like a remake version of uh, more so the arcade than the NES original. But the controls themselves uh, do mirror the NES version. You actually just hold your Wiimote. They actually have motion controls as well. But you hold your Wiimote to the side, and uh, you just use the, the D-pad and uh, the 1 and 2 buttons as A and B um, in order to use the you know attacks. Because literally you just punch and you dodge or you duck. Um, the game itself, Punch Out, for those that haven't played it, and, and just to refresh y'all's memory, even though the game seems like it's an action game or a, or a sports game, um, the gameplay itself is actually more like a puzzle game, where mm-hmm. you kind of have to um, memorize the patterns of the enemies that you're facing and then sort of apply that knowledge in order to win. Like the original the original Punch Out. Well, that's, exactly that's, like that's, that. that's exactly what I'm saying. It's, yeah. That's the whole Punch Out series is like that. Yeah. But for those that are unfamiliar with Punch Out, like for example, when I was a child, um, you know, playing Punch Out originally on the NES, I just thought, you know, I thought to me it was like these these boxers are um, just really good, mm-hmm. and they always seem to know what I'm doing, and so they would just they would just beat me up, and I'm like, wow, I'm just not good enough at this game. <laughs> then when I got a little bit older, I started realizing, oh, it's all about learning their patterns, mm-hmm. and, and then I, then you can just beat them if you just know their pattern. So it became a very different experience. Um, but what I like about this version of Punch Out, Punch Out Wii. Um, the gameplay itself is simple and and the, essentially the same as the original. All they've really added are um, very high production values. So the game has this sort of um, three it's a three D models uh, but cell shaded, mm-hmm. very similar look to uh, the arcade um, arcade version of, of uh, Punch Out or specifically Super Punch Out. Um, and um, also they've got this these little vignettes. They use the same sort of uh, villains as or the same sort of opponents as they did before. Uh, people like uh, King King Hippo or Don Flamingo, Glass Joe, uh, yeah, uh, Glass Joe, and they have essentially the same fighters, but um, they give them a little bit more character. You have little uh, like they do these little uh, sort of vignettes where they kind of give you a little bit a little bit background. It's usually presented in a, a humorous way. Mm-hmm. The game itself too, as as even as you're fighting between rounds, it doesn't really take itself very seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, what the main thing that I like about it, I'll say, is that it it feels like. Um, the developers really had a lot of respect for the original and sort of just, instead of trying to um, reinvent the wheel or try to do something drastically different from what you would expect, like my other recent Wii purchase, Metroid Other M did, um, <laughs> to its detriment, um, Punch-Out! Wii is just basically a, you know, 
high production value, modern version of the original. And one of the things that I haven't played it myself, but I watched uh, the Game Grumps play it uh, at one point. <clears throat> and what's kind of cool is when you've beat the game the first time, there's actually a kind of an extended... Yes, the title defense through. mode. And yeah. I did want to mention that too, especially particularly some of the jokes that they do. Like, for example, King Hippo, mm -hmm. um, he's, he's famous for having uh, his belly is sort of his weakness, his mm -hmm. weak point. And um, when you fight him in title defense mode, he comes at you, he has a sewer... Uh, top, whatever you call it, sewer lid, mm -hmm. um, covering his belly. So in order to beat him, you have to knock it loose first mm -hmm. before you can actually... Oh, use manhole him. cover. Manhole cover. Or like you. a glass joke comes into it now with like a little boxing helmet on in addition because you like really rung his bell last time. Yeah. So, yeah. so everyone like is sort of marked by the battle you had with them previously. It's not just a second playthrough but harder. It's actually like aware of the fact that you have played this campaign and now you're the defending mm -hmm. That's fun. Defending your title. Yeah. And it is harder, but it's... It, <laughs> It takes it, again, it takes it in such a way that even though the game actually can get pretty frustrating, um, it's it's having so much fun with what it's doing with the source material that I think it's, it's really hard to actually get angry at it for too long. Mm -hmm. um, even for me, when I'm sometimes sucking. And eventually eventually you catch on, that's the good part, because it's, uh, it's less about Twitch skill and it's more about uh, memorizing patterns. Hmm. So eventually mm -hmm. you'll, you'll win if you keep trying. And recently I've been playing a game called Super Hot. Um, super hot. And it's a PC shooter, uh, relatively short single player campaign. Um, it's really interesting. I'm not really, I'm not generally into shooters. But what this does is it's this sort of whitewashed environment. Everything is white um, and shaded. Uh, enemies all, are all red. Um, interactable objects are all black. And the gimmick that they have sort of is that time stands still when you're not moving. But when you say, hold on, back up a bit. When you say a whitewash environment, are you, you're saying it's black and white except for... It's very stylized. It looks almost like vector graphics okay. in a way. Uh, vector is not quite the right term. but And when you say it's a shooter, mm -hmm. are you talking about shoot em up Or first-person shooter. Oh, first-person yeah, shooter. 3D. Okay. Yeah, 3D first-person shooter. Um, but like I said, when you're not moving, uh, and mo aiming counts as moving, but not quite as much as actually moving your feet, time um, slows to a crawl, basically. Uh, and so it creates these really cool action sequences where you um, can sort of move a little bit and someone shoots at you, you stop time, you sort of sidestep the bullet, take aim, shoot at him. Um, and it does something that I've been wishing a lot of games would do for a long time, which is that it lets you sort of have more control over a lot of this fast-paced action, and then it plays back your, um, your successful run when you finish the level. Uh, and so it plays back a full a full speed replay without the slowdowns. And what it looks like is this really awesome ac action sequence where you're like narrowly dodging bullets and taking people out in like one shot, just like spinning around, throwing something at them, punching them in the face. Um, and like you said, Jim, it's almost a bit of a puzzler. You sort of will find that you fail a level several times, but then you start to memorize this enemy comes out of this store at this time, and I can, you know. When I'm out of ammo after shooting these two guys, I can throw my gun at this one and take his weapon, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's actually an interesting little um, feature they have. It's still in beta, so it doesn't work perfectly, called a Killstagram, where you upload your replay of a, um, a successful run through a level, um, and you can share that with people, so that's kind of cool. The uh, story is kind of doing this like subversive, fourth-wall-breaking meta thing um, that I wasn't a huge fan of at first, but they also seem to be very self-aware of what it is. Uh, so it comes across as less pretentious than you would expect. <laughs> um, and they have like this little gimmick at the end where you basically share um, the game with people uh, using a very specific marketing term, <laughs> which you might have seen my, uh, my post on Facebook because I decided to just play along because it was funny to me. Um, where you say, this is the most innovative shooter, shooter I've ever played, or I've played in years, and then people click on, they play Super Hot, mm -hmm. and then basically part of the plot is, like, again, weird fourth wall breaking, um, where you're getting, like, sort of indoctrinated into something and then trying to get other people indoctrinated as well. Uh, so, really interesting game, definitely um, worth watching, if not playing, but uh, it's relatively cheap, and I definitely think it's worth giving it a shot. Cool, yeah, no, it, it actually sounds interesting. I was looking, I was actually looking up here trying to see if I could, because I couldn't think of the name of it. Mm -hmm. There was a, a, a martial arts video game that tried to do that kind of slow down time. Oh, you're thinking of... Um, what was the name of that? Oh, what I, was it, it? really escapes me, and... and it was, a, it was an interesting concept. It didn't really work it, that it was, well in execution. It was, it was but a turn-based 3D fighter, and basically you would say, like, I can't remember flex this muscle or retract this muscle, and you would make your figures ah. do stuff. And you have Quop? No, not no, Quop. No, Although no, it's, no. it does kind quop of... combat. If you're, if you're bad at it, it looks like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it was... Uh, I, I didn't really think it was... Ended up that... It, it ended up not being that good of an experience, but it was an interesting idea. I'll put it that way. Um, Torbash is the name of the game. 
Torah Bash. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And there was a, uh, a Wii port at one point, actually. Really? Um, but I, I was mainly familiar with it on the PC. Mm. Yeah, similar similar concept. It has, like, the, the whole thing where it starts off, you're doing step-by-step sort of stuff, um, and then uh, it plays out in real time afterward. But this is, that's much more tedious. Super hot's definitely intuitive. Mm-hmm. This is the Gaming Meta. News and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. I actually just wanted to talk a little bit about this place that opened up in uh, December here in the uh, Richardson area, known as the Free Play Arcade. A um, suburb of Dallas. Yeah, suburb of Dallas. Yeah. Um, so the reason I, I bring it up, actually, is that there's not really that many um, arcades anymore. It's yeah, we talked about that in our flashback episode. Right, yeah. and so um, I, when I found out about this place, I thought it would be pretty cool to go check it out, and it actually is um, a legitimate arcade. I mean, it has mostly, most of the games are old. Well, the reason <laughs> What's I, an illustration? The, shocking the, the reason I say that, but the you reason I say that... walk in and it doesn't have a cardboard standees. Wait a minute! Well, it's because a lot of the places that will say, if you look online for an arcade, um, most of the places that you find are either it's a bar, and then the arcade is the arcade element is secondary. There's like a few machines, but it's really about getting you in there to drink. Mm. Um, or it's like other sorts of games, you know, like skee ball or something. And mm-hmm. it's more of like like something like a Dave and Buster's where or a main event, yeah, yeah like that you. sort of thing. So it's not really an arcade. Um, this free play really is an arcade. It's just a ten dollar cover charge and then all the um, machines themselves are free play. They also have pinball machines that are also free play. And he's most doing air games, quotes whenever he's yeah, saying free. Free, free. Because <laughs> it is it's it's free in the sense that once you're in it's free, but you still have to pay to get it. Um, and they do act they do serve um, alcohol there. They do serve food, but that's not the main reason that you go. That's not like the main that's more like you're already there. Now they're trying to get more money out of you kind of situation. How real are the nachos? Is it like plastic and cardboard or so their their food is surprisingly good. Oh. Um, I, I actually was very impressed. Uh, they have like a uh, little like you know pizzas and sandwiches and stuff like that. Presumably that's not free. Pay a cover no. charge and eat the buffet. No. <laughs> um, well, that's Vegas. A, they actually do have a surprisingly good beer selection too. They have a lot of uh, you know uh, import beers. I think they have some deals with local uh, brewing companies nice. too. F- free refills? Uh, no free refills. <laughs> I'm trying. I don't, I don't know. know. <laughs> I don't have any place yeah. aside from no on beer. No, from like an all like an all inclusive resort would ever give you a free refill. Yeah, I, I attribute right? my Lego collection to not drinking. So. At which point you've already paid for it. It's yeah. still not free. Yeah. Um, but what I would say is the most uh, one of the more interesting things about this place um, is. Most of the games are from like the 80s and early 90s. There's a few newer games. Really? From that. Yes. And so you've got, for example, they have all three Donkey Kong games Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., nice. uh, Donkey Kong 3. They have uh, like Crazy Taxi. That one's from like Donkey Kong. Oh, Kong one of my favorites. Um, Just they to have play that on the game uh, Outrun. Game. They have game like game. Centipede, Millipede. I mean, they have a whole bunch of. But then they also have other, you know, games like Dream they have the Simpsons arcade game, for example, like Magic Sword, Sunset Rider. So they have a bunch of games, but they also trade out the um, arcade machines that they have in there like every few weeks to a month. Really? So, yeah, so With what? You, How? Well, they have more arcades than what they put out. So they, they just rotate them out? Yeah, they rotate them out. Uh, probably and I give them maintenance when they do it, too, I would imagine. I would imagine so, too, because they're actually in surprisingly good shape, especially the Donkey Kong cabinets where... Since those are so old, you normally that you normally find them with like cigarette burns. Do they or, have pinball? Because they have pinball. I'm going. Yeah, they have a lot of pinball. That's Dude, what I was they have uh, four cabinets. They recently added the Adams Family one. Was oh, the that's one, one of my favorites. Um, I wonder why. Hmm? <laughs> Doctor Adam Bracken. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I never made the connection. <laughs> um, but I, it, I, I will say, I will say, it's a pretty, it's a pretty interesting place. Um, it's surprisingly packed, actually, and I don't know if that's just because it's so new. Hopefully, it'll maintain its business because I know the arcade business seems to be pretty cutthroat um, in America. Not too many of them around, but uh, it does sort of, it has sort of, uh, I guess, its own niche because there's not that many places around that are just arcades. What's it called again? When you say free play, when you say cutthroat. Can, can you elaborate on that? I mean, uh, I specifically mean that it seems like arcades can't make any money in the U.S. That's what I mean. So they just go out of business because they can't make money. Yeah. There that's... were several in Austin from when I used when I used to go to college mm-hmm. there, um, when I went to UC Austin, and they have since all shuttered, except for one, which moved into a different part of the city. Not, not to start my segment early, but I do wonder what VR is going to do to the arcade culture. Oh, we, we yeah. actually had a little we bit talked of a little about, about that, that yeah. um, a couple weeks ago. Okay. Yeah. Malls. I think the I think the ticket is malls. Get people back into malls. 
Um, but anyway, their website is freeplayrichardson.com. Yeah, their website is hilarious. If you, if you scroll to the very bottom, it basically says something like, we designed this website to piss off web developers or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. this temporary website was designed solely to irritate web devs <laughs> while our full site is loaded and launched. Seriously, I'm typing this up in Word right now, and I am going to save it as an HTML file. You can access the old <laughs> development blog yeah. here. So yeah, it's. That's I like awesome. these guys. Yeah, I want. I want them to is, save is my that, money. Is that a cry for help, or do they actually <laughs> already have people working on it? I'm not sure because, uh, like I, like I said, I th- believe their actual open date was December fifteenth. Um, so they've been open for. So they've had six months. Right. They've been open long enough to actually go back and, and have a better site. Maybe they just haven't. It doesn't bothered. take six months to build yeah, a bar for, site for a ten dollar yeah. cover charge. Right. <laughs> <laughs> have they broken even yet? I don't know. <laughs> I would imagine so, just based on uh, the drink, the drink sales. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Because uh, the prices aren't bad. I know you can get like a you can get like a um, um, an import beer or not import, but a um, that's what I'm looking for. Like one of the more craft craft. Thank you, a craft beer for like four dollars. So I'm always entertained when someone refers to something as craft anything. Yeah. <laughs> it's like here. It's, it's just like here's my I made it myself beer. Yeah. is what I'm hearing. Yes. When I hear that most <laughs> of the time. Well, it's because it's a local Arts and brewery. Yeah. That's exactly what I'm referring to. Yeah. So yeah. This is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. All right, so I want to do kind of a quick shout out to Pixel Starships. Um, I, you know, I, I like to download free games, and uh, some of them have you know, built in pay stuff, and some of them have a paywall, and some of them don't. So I typically just ignore the ones for the show that have paywalls. But um, this one actually does okay, and it seems to do it right. But um, what it is, what it reminded me of was FTL, Faster Than the Light. Remember that game? Mm-hmm. Um, except it's for mobile, and you're, instead of looking top down, you're looking at a side slice of your ship. And you can actually upgrade your ships and, and install the rooms and that sort of a thing. Mechanically, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the tower games. Yeah, not, Tiny Tower. Yeah, tiny not, Death Star. Not, mm-hmm. not, tiny, not tower defense games, because that's a different thing, mm-hmm. but you're exactly right. Tiny Tower, Tiny Death Star. I played that one for, gosh like four or five months before I finally bottomed out on it. Uh, but this one, again, similar mechanic because you're creating rooms and then you're populating them. Um, and apparently I got a really rare pull with my very first crew member because I pulled Jesus. <laughs> um, so Are you sure it's not Jesus? Uh, well, no, because um, he's uh, got the white robe and the beard and, the, and it, it's totally Jesus. Um, so immediately then I, I put him into um, the... Uh, the weapons room, because that just made sense. And so he's been firing my, my <laughs> cannon of truth. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of fun, because I've got, uh, I've got this thing that, that picks up stuff as I go by, and, and I can up- upgrade my shields and upgrade my everything else. And um, you go into these fights, and one of the things I noticed from the very beginning, and you're going to love this, Jim, hmm. is I got my butt kicked just straight out of the gate, because I, um, I chose to go to a place that I shouldn't have been. I had no business being. Um, so it has kind of a... Uh, well, it's got a PvP element. It's got a, a, a join a guild kind of an element. Some of those, those little um, MMO type feeling things. And so uh, you can actually just pull up the chat from, from pretty much anywhere and see what's going on with the community right there. Everybody who's playing it is logged in. They're chatting, that kind of a thing. So it's a little bit different, and it, it's a lot of fun in the sense that you feel like you're not just playing a mobile game by yourself, but there's right. actually people involved. You can challenge them. I'll bring my ship in, blow you up. You'll bring your ship in, blow me up, that uh, kind of a thing. Now, when you say... Uh you can chat with anyone. Is this sort of is it comparable to Baron's chat from World of Warcraft? Uh, n- that is to say, totally inane and not related to the game at all. No, yes, the Baron's was notorious I, 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 for that. I don't know, <laughs> honestly. Um, for those that are not old school World of Warcraft uh, players, Baron's was a um, a zone. Like I think it was like a level. Was it like twenty or something for yeah, uh, for Horde? It was. It's yeah. still there. Well, it still is, but people, there's no real reason to go there nowadays. It's true. It's like, I play Alliance. <laughs> oh boy. With the 12 year olds? No, they're all 20 now. Was there an Alliance equivalent to Baron Strat? Not really. No. Not really. No. <laughs> it's not as fun without the. Baron's chat was, was just so ridiculous. It was basically I think just the, 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 the reason is, crazy. I think, because you're literally running through a desert and there's a ton of empty space yeah. and so yeah. you're doing a lot of running between and places. It also became a hub. Mm-hmm. I think the closest thing to Baron's chat for Alliance was probably like Iron Forge or Stormwind. Yeah, but those are cities. Those I know. Don't even count. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's like they, those shouldn't count. Those probably the closest would be 
Um, probably, I would say probably Iron Forge was a little more ridiculous, but it wasn't. Like Forge. They were never. Yeah, they were never at that level of barons. Because, like you said, those are major cities. And see, I thought the faction chat was inane, so I guess I just didn't understand your question. Hmm. Um, Regardless, anyway, sorry. Uh, I, I think it's a fun little um, delve, and it's worth downloading since it's free. And then, um, you know, if you discover you like it, uh, like I did, because I really loved FTL, then enjoy. And now, this week's meaty topic of discussion. Phil Johnson, our guest, what? Uh, coming from uh, Playful Corp. Is that the name of the company? <laughs> I'm, I'm, being, I'm being a professional interviewer here, Phil. Is, did I get that right? Did I get that right, mister? <laughs> I'm trying to be professional. Let me be professional. I've got my tie on. I'm wearing a full suit. I'm sweating over here. This is, this you've is, done this all is, the necessary research about the person I've you're got interviewing. A, I've got a top hat. And this is uh, this is Corp as opposed a to A monocle. Corp. I'm dressed like Mr. This Peanuts. Is, this is not the playful core. This is playful Corp. Oh, yes. not yes. not like Corpse? Like no, there's dead. no S. No. It's corporation. Corporation. If you had if you had an S, it'd be core. Do, does it have a corpus, like a body of work? Right there. Well, yes. All now, right then. Now we do. <laughs> how long we have games that are out? That's actually my. That was kind of my first question. Is uh, specifically Playful Corp. How long has it been in business? Has it only been? Uh, is this our first game? So I've official? I've been there for two years. Mm-hmm. Uh, a little bit more than two years now. Um, before it was, I think it was around for about a year before that, and before and even before that. Uh, it actually had a different company name. I think it was called Verse mm-hmm. beforehand, and that was formed out of uh, uh, the the leadership structure that was uh, New Toy, that mm. then became Zynga with Friends, and after they left Zynga, they went and formed. They did um, Wars with Friends, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the the leadership of uh, Playful Corp is basically the same people. Hmm. So I'm seeing a trend. You guys kind of pioneer new platforms. That is actually one of the things that uh, the CEO, Paul Bettner, is all about. Is like, you mm-hmm. know, he, anytime he sees an opportunity with a uh, an emerging technology or, an, you know, some new market, uh, it, it's, you know, he, he he's always talking about taking the risk and actually investing in those new fields. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bleeding edge. <laughs> yeah, actually. Uh, a big part of it is, actually, uh, a big part of our thesis at Playful is um, you know, taking really daring steps and trying to figure out what what the next thing is going to be. I admire that. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, it's, that's really it's, cool. yeah. I mean, it's a, it's it's you know, it, it, half of it is going into this really volatile field, but half of it is just how fun is it to be like one of the first game companies in the world mm-hmm. asking questions that no one else in the world has had an opportunity to even ask in terms of like you know what in VR. You know what? What makes a good game in VR? Mm-hmm. So, what does make a good game? In that VR? is an excellent question, and I think it's a question we will continue to ask ourselves for the next ten years. Oh wow! Um, but yeah, I, I would agree with that statement too, because mm-hmm. it's, it's like any time you're you're moving into a new technology, um, initially you're going to have to have a lot of these experimental um, experiences before mm-hmm. you can really find out what works and what doesn't. You're not going to know until you try. But Phil, VR is just a peripheral, is it not? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> VR VR is much more than just put you know just an accessory. I mean, uh, you know, if, if you talk, it also depends on who you talk to because if you're going to refer to it as a peripheral or just an accessory, mm-hmm. um, try saying that to someone who plays a first person shooter with a keyboard and mouse. Sure. Uh, and then put someone who plays Call of Duty on their PS4 or whatever with a controller. Uh-huh. You, these two people cannot coexist, almost. Almost, yeah. In fact, uh, there's a lot of slowing down and lagging that, that occurs intentionally um, mm-hmm. to, yeah. to make uh, it so they can. Yeah, like Unreal Tournament 3, when it came out for the PlayStation 3, mm-hmm. uh, it actually included keyboard and mouse support, but by virtue of being on a console, they actually slowed the game down by right. 20%. Right. Mm-hmm. 20%? Yeah. Wow, I thought it was like 12. Uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it, was a, it was either 20 or 25. Okay, uh, I believe it. But that, that's like hard numbers right there. You'd know. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I'm personally, I'm, I mean, it, not to get into that whole uh, bottomless pit of which is better, keyboard or mouse, or keyboard and mouse, and yeah, we, that was learned long ago. Yeah. It's keyboard and mouse, obviously. So Disagree. we've already moved on. Disagree, but um, <laughs> the the thing, the, another another avenue to consider is like, you know, you take someone who plays uh, flight simulators. Mm-hmm. If they're really into it, there is no other way to do this than to have, have a joystick. A, yeah, have a joystick. Yeah, VR. 
exactly. is not an accessory. It is not about whether you can play a certain kind of game with a joystick. It's not about whether you can play a certain kind of game with a gamepad or keyboard and mouse. VR is an entirely different experience. It's 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 a it's a different platform, and that's that's why you cannot call it an accessory. You cannot call it a peripheral, because it unto itself, most games just do not translate. You can, you can in theory play a game with a, a joystick or like a flight stick if you you know if it's mapped correctly. Mm-hmm. Uh, VR you cannot by by virtue of the way it works by uh, positional tracking, rotational tracking, the way that the camera is implemented in the game, uh, the the way that you present information within a game, uh, because the thing, for example, uh, you cannot go from you cannot just simply take uh, a two D game. You cannot just take, uh, say, Super Mario Three D World, or, or sorry, uh, yeah, or it's not the Hedgehog. And just say it's now VR. Mm-hmm. You can't do that. Uh, I, and I will say not not to totally disagree with you, but I will mm-hmm. say that um, um, I do have I have the uh, the Gear VR mm-hmm. um, set up, and I actually downloaded a version of Quake that runs in uh, VR. Yeah, but that's a first person to exactly, VR. and that's kind of yeah. what I was. That was kind of one of the things I was going to say was like so a first me, person experience. Let me ask you this. Since you're, since I have a, I don't have a Gear VR. Yeah. Uh, for the moment, I'm an Apple guy, so I have an iPhone and. You're just not going to get that soft. That software library is just not available to me. Mm-hmm. So when you play Quake, how is the HUD represented? Like, how is your health visible? Um, every, yeah, everything is just presented as though you were actually playing the game on PC. Mm-hmm. So it's everything is just up on your face, closer to your face, but mm-hmm. it's still presented the same way that. It so they keep PC. it. It's, it's constantly within the near field of your view. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's closer. Yeah. Now, if, if you, you turn that, your head, is it does it does it know that, and does it turn your character's head? Mm-hmm. So it's hard locked to your face. Yeah. And like yeah, yeah. The, the way that the way that your turning works, like I, I usually just sit in my computer mm-hmm. chair, and so um, I just I swivel like in my chair to move to move around, and then <laughs> I use you have to have to play it with a controller. So right. I have a controller in my hand, and that actually is the forward yeah. movement. Or shooting. so there's an interesting thing that's happening there. That now I'm just going to bounce off this one as an example here. Uh, HUDs traditionally are just they're the last thing drawn on the screen, and mm-hmm. that's that's it. You forget about it. You're done. Correct. When it comes to VR, you don't have that opportunity because you have to actually remember that you're rendering everything twice. Mm. And it's really important, actually. And this You've never, ever had to worry about this before. But if you're dealing with, particularly with a 2D HUD, like if you just have a sprite or, or just some sort of like draw rectangle on the screen, mm-hmm. you have to be aware of the relative depth in, in, in reference to each eye. Uh, one thing that you're going to run into a lot is like, uh, let's take Lucky's Tail. Uh, we experimented with having Lucky be able to run behind objects. You know, you can't see him through. Like, say, if he runs, if he runs into a cave or a little hole in the ground, and he can go to the left and right, and your your camera still stays outside in the overworld. Well, a lot of first person, not a lot of first person. A lot, that's what we do now. We're doing first person games, but um, a lot of platformers will figure out ways of rendering. Uh, where your character is, whether that's by putting a little like sign above, relatively speaking, where their head is, mm-hmm. or the character when he goes behind a rock, or something. yeah, when he goes behind a rock, or, or they do the little, little darkened outline, or some games will do like a uh, opacity clip around yeah, them. I was about to say that too. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. the other thing they do. All of those things present challenges. Uh, in that, you know, if you represent anything that is fundamentally two dimensional, like. Uh, if you did the dark outline of the character and you kind of you can kind of see their silhouette through the the rocks, where do you render that? Mm. Where is that? How is that rendered to the uh, the player's view? And by doing a stencil draw over the frame, you mm. actually get this sort of like magic eye effect hmm. where it oh, it really? like looks sunken in and it just just looks wrong. Right. And the same thing is true of like uh, pause screens. It's like if you like hit pause and you just have this little thing pop up in front of you it's just drawn after the fact yeah you have to be aware of where it's rendered relative to everything else in the world because in vr you can you know if you get if you decide to put put the headset on and just like put your face inside of the walls it goes all the way up to the clipping plane mm-hmm. so what that means is anytime you draw something and say if like if you're looking at like the the screen is uh, has a certain amount of like, a high variance of depth where it's like the like Get uh, like really down to the ground, maybe, and you have like the grass going just underneath your face, basically, and you see this distance. Hit the pause screen. That's drawn after the fact. If it's not actually literally part of the world, or at least rendered in such, such a way that you're expecting it to have a certain immediate depth, and even if you do that, uh, you actually get this sort of cut-in effect of everything that goes in. So it actually 
breaks immersion because it's your your brain is trying to process where this piece of information is. That uh, makes total sense. Yeah, spatially, and it's it's immersion breaking, a little nauseating, and you have to design around it. And so, just even simply simply uh, displaying information becomes a huge challenge because how do you want to show it to the player? How is it going to be the most comfortable way for you to look at it? And fundamentally speaking, Quake is a good example. I'm glad you brought it up. Mm. It's very difficult to figure out the answer to that because the way you described it, it's closer than everything else. But it means you're, when you glance down at the information, you're losing, like your eyes are going to refocus, you're going to focus on that number, and you're going to lose focus at the depth of the scene. And so in VR, uh, and this is going to be true of, ga- uh, this is true of traditional game design, actually. Um, you have to be aware of how you're treating things spatially and how the information is being presented. And I think that's one of the major diversions from traditional computer game development we're going to see is we can no longer treat the screen as here's this plane of information. You're not lo- you're no longer looking at an image. Mm-hmm. You're looking at a space. Mm-hmm. Uh, and tabletop game design has a huge place in VR game design because uh, what I personally have found, and this is something that I'm trying to look more into, and we did a little bit of this Lucky's Tale because like the pause screen is actually part. It's it's rendered in the world, mm-hmm. literally. So I have to see that to know and what that, you mean. That's, how, that, we make, that's, that's cool. how we make it feel comfortable because it's there. It's it's a thing physically in the space, um, but just simply popping information on in front of you is actually really jarring. So treating your information design as term in terms of spatial design is incredibly important. Which means that. If you want to have like a deck of cards, the deck of cards should be on a table in front of you rather than just rendered in front of your face mm-hmm, as mm-hmm. you're as you're playing the game. And so, mm. we, the way that we present information has to be very much uh, diegetic. Uh, another good example would be like sports. If you want to play, if you make a sports game like a a baseball game, having having not done that, but I'm going to venture a guess that one of the better things that's going to rise to the top is the scoreboard. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you physically look over and at see the scoreboard. the scoreboard rather than having yeah. halftime. Right, exactly. All these animations pop sense. up in your face. And, and right now it, it emulates TV broadcasts right. with like little pop-ups uh-huh. and yes. stuff like that. That's yes. right. Mm-hmm. And, I, and as opposed to your experience being in the stands, because I know when I first got the VR, they had all these little, um, the Gear VR, mm-hmm. they had these little uh, demonstrations with different videos where it's like, hey, here's what it's like to be in a sporting event as though you're there kind of situation. Here's what it's like to be at like... Um, I believe it was one of the, I think it was like a Carnival show or something mm-hmm. like that. So just to give you an idea, and it's, it's, it's pretty interesting, actually. It's very different from actually watching it on television. Sure. Um, so uh, to back up a little bit, because you, you started mentioning Lucky's Tale, and for those that maybe haven't heard of Lucky's oh, Tale, right. I don't know what that is, <laughs> could you give us like a sort of a brief explanation of what the game's about? And, and oh, yeah, yeah, sure. So Lucky's Tale is a full 3D platformer experience that... We designed specifically for VR. There is no 2D version. There is no, there is no play it on your screen version of the game. I think post release, a couple people figured out how to hack it so they would only render one eye on the screen. And uh, I guess they hooked up the secondary joystick to looking around. And that is not the way the game is meant to be played. And mm-hmm. uh, anyone who do, who can do that because it, it happened is it on Reddit or something. That's not the way. That's not how you get the full experience because you know you can look over your shoulder. You can look completely behind you. Uh, it's not simply a a look shooter uh, thing we have set up with like the bomb toss. And so, but anyway, the gist of it is uh, Lucky is a he's a friendly little fox whose best friend Piggy was kidnapped by a tentacle monster named Glorp S. Glorpington. Or sorry, Gloop S. Glorpington. Mm-hmm. Wait, no, no, no. Sorry, we we never referred to him as full name in the studio. It's I think it's like Glorp S. Gloopington. Mm. So you heard it here fo- yeah. first, folks. <laughs> so it's it's actually not really in the game. I think it's like written somewhere, but the uh, I think the narration doesn't refer. It's like the, they just call him Glorp. But anyway, so Glorp kidnaps Piggy, who's his best friend slash piggy bank. Ah, so <laughs> that, 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 that we find the real motivation, the, yes. the financial motivation. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. At, at its core, Lucky's <laughs> Tale is a story of greed and vengeance. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, to, it, to, to, to be fair, as a full-time dad, I kind of feel that way about my wife. She's <laughs> sort of my piggy bank too, so I understand. Well, that that that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll just edit this all out. Then that's fine. It's like, all right, let's just air the dirty laundry talking about VR games. Um, 
<laughs> so anyway, it is a platformer. You know, you control Lucky, and your head is the camera, uh, a la Mario 64, uh, where your your view is Lakitu, uh, just like Mario 64 did. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, you can look around, you can lean left and right, you can do all these other things. And uh, so you know, it is, it is a game that literally, you know, even if like some you know some really smart kid on the internet hacks it so you can actually play it with a controller around their one eye, it is not what we designed the game to be. And the visuals are designed from the ground up for at least this first generation of VR to be the most impactful, comfortable, friendly, and immersive thing we can have. But that's something that, so, hearing you guys talk about the development, I've been really impressed by how you guys have anticipated and addressed a lot of these concerns people have about VR. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, really designing for your platform. Right. And a lot of it has to do with the way we design the levels, uh, the gameplay. Uh, I mentioned, you know, having positional tracking. So if you lean left and right, your view moves with your body motion. Oh, that's good. And that is that's crucial to that gameplay because we actually we, we we set up situations where you pretty much have to lean left and right. Oh, because oh. Lucky will pass behind pillars, and if you want to see what he's doing, you have to like lean over and see him. Nice. Uh, and so controllers, no matter how you, how you set those up, they can't do that. Now let me let me ask you specifically about that, since you mentioned controls. Mm -hmm. um, so. This is a game that you're playing. You have the the you wear the Oculus Rift over your head, mm -hmm. and then for the actual control itself, are you using your mouse? Are you using a, a gamepad in your use, hand? It is a gamepad based game. Okay. Uh, and the Rift itself comes with an Xbox One controller for Windows. Mm -hmm. So it is we're we're building for the platform. We're, we're building for the controls that they that you were given. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that they come out of sense. the box. Um, <clears throat> and um, you know graphically. Uh, a huge amount of research went into that uh, from whether or not we should use textures on the surfaces. Right now we're actually, we do a very solid color uh, system for the first game. Um, and that's because we found initially, and we've done, we've done some really cool research, and we're doing really cool research on where to go next, but uh, initially we were finding things like, you know, things like normal maps, if they, if they express too much depth in VR, your eyes can still detect that there's, it's a flat surface. Mm. And so, that's part of why we didn't pursue textures too greatly. But you know, you know, so all our characters are textured, and uh, they all have normal maps. They all have a. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, all, we're we're using like physically based rendering for everything. Uh, and so, you know, for for first foray, we really wanted everyone to just feel like this was a place that they are, and we wanted to remove any question about that. Mm -hmm. And so, most of uh, what really draws you into that space is the lighting. Uh, we worked with uh, Unity 5, uh, mm -hmm. and they, they actually re fully replaced the system from Unity 4. Uh, they went from Beast Lighting to this thing called Enlighten, and we switched a little bit late. But uh, after you know, after a, a bit of research and uh, iteration on how to work with those new lighting systems, like it was really nice. And once we got in some of those uh, some of the new features from the the engine, uh, it became super immersive, and we're, we're, we were really excited about how that worked out. Because light, it turns out, lighting is like I, I would venture to say 95% of what allows a player to be immersed in the space. And mm -hmm. actually, it doesn't matter about the fidelity of the graphics so much. Uh, it doesn't matter about how many polygons there are. As long as it renders cleanly and the light works correctly with these surfaces, it can feel like you're there. And so that, like, that was a huge part of immersion for us. Mm -hmm. So real, realistic lighting, even if the graphics themselves are... Because Lucky's Tale has this sort of like... Um, you know, cartoonish. It's very. It's it's a very um, you know kind of beautiful game. Mm -hmm. It has this sort of like, it, it does remind me of like because you mentioned Mario sixty four. It reminds yeah. me of, um, well, I guess a better comparison would be like a more contemporary version like mm -hmm. Mario Galaxy or something. But yeah. it reminds me of like that style of that sort of like you know cartoonish, um, you know, very colorful characters, uh, kind of like. You know, Disney slash mm -hmm. Nintendo esque kind of aesthetic. Yeah, in heard, uh, internally, we comparisons. Yeah, yeah, I was a huge yeah. influence on this. Internally, we, we refer to it as fondant. Fondant. Yeah, we want oh, like cake. The, yeah, the, the the world looks like cake. It looks oh, like it's all been covered in frosting oh, and fondant. Oh. And that's actually oh, I never I never that, thought of that, but that makes that a lot was of our sense. that was our internal metaphor for the first game. Is hmm. like we're like, hey, let's make it cake. <laughs> let's make let's make this space look delicious. Let's make it a, a place that you just want to look at. Mm. So it's it'd be it's normal to get hungry while playing the game. I, I, I'm well. I'm a bad person <laughs> to ask because I'm always hungry. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna go yes. <laughs> uh, speaking speaking of feelings while you play the game, yeah. Because this is something where, um, for example, playing Quake, which obviously was not designed for VR. Someone no. just literally 
put it in there. Mm-hmm. It makes me sick after about 15 minutes. Yes. And this is something that I know, um, having personally not really played with the Oculus Rift, mm-hmm. but I've heard other people complain and raise concerns about the Oculus Rift in the sense of, oh, it might it, it will make us sick if we play it for a certain length of time, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Is this something that y'all have spent a lot of time sort of researching and figuring out how can we design this game so that a player can can be immersed in this world and play for a you know decent gaming session without getting you know, experiencing vertigo. Yes. Um, th- to say that we spent a lot of time researching how to make the game more comfortable would be kind of an understatement. Hmm. Uh, literally the better part of half a year went into figuring out how to do it the most comfortable way possible. And we weren't even done then. Uh, hmm. Once And once we went into proper production, we continued to work on that. Um, that is a question that is going to linger for a very long time, even within our own studio, because... What we made is incredibly comfortable. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a, a minuscule number of people have reported sickness. Really? Because yeah. wasn't that number at like 40% or something just a couple of years ago in general for VR? Mm-hmm. Well, there's, there's a number of things that's been going on to help with that. Oh, okay. Um, so with, with Lucky's Tale, the camera, our camera decisions, how we dealt with acceleration, the way it can move, how we move it, how we deal with jumping between locations... Uh, those were all cornerstone decisions for us in terms of how the camera has to work to make it more, the most comfortable experience possible. Mm. Uh, one of the challenges that you're going to see, and this is one of the, th- one of the things that is like when we first, de- you don't hear it now, but when we first debuted Lucky, there was like third person VR. So because <laughs> everyone was That's thinking, what I thought too, first every person. single yeah. person out there almost, I don't want to generalize, but mm. uh, it's, it mm. felt like everyone was hoping that VR was going to be this end-all, be-all for, hey, Half-Life 3 is going to be a launch title on this. And what the community found so quickly is first-person shooters in particular, Mm -hmm. which is the one everyone thought, like, oh my god, this, are almost the worst. Mm -hmm. It's because of the fast pace. More than maybe, that. I mean, more than I, that. Because I know with Quake, because it's so fast paced, I think that's what made me sick. Because I'm constantly having yeah. to swivel in my freaking chair. I'm gonna die. <laughs> I don't think yeah. it's so much about. Well, that's, you see, you just answered one of the big questions there. It's not yeah. so much about um, what you see in first person, because every camera is always first person. You will, you see from your perspective, that's true. no matter what. Yeah. First person shooters have an interesting challenge ahead of them, and they're gonna they're gonna fix this. They're gonna tackle mm-hmm. this in like I don't know, Halo Eight or something is gonna be amazing on them. <laughs> um, and what the what the challenge is, you can be first person. You, there are games already like the Vive is solving this in a strong way uh, with room scale VR. Hmm. And the and when you think about it, what does room scale VR solve for you? So assuming you're playing on the Gear VR, you know the Quake game or any other first person shooter. Uh, if you're doing a twin stick game, yeah. control even with keyboard and mouse, play Team Fortress Two in VR, for example, turning your head. You can look left and right and use WASD and move or the move joystick. But if you want to turn all the way around, you have to, yeah. you have to fit either physically turn mm-hmm. or you have to move the mouse which is, or use the turn buttons, which is the singularly most nauseating yeah. motion it's, yeah, it's, a game it's can It's do. terrible. I tried out. Um, and this was, of course, not built for VR per se, but... There was someone who was in a very early alpha of a thing they were doing at school, mm-hmm. and they let me try out the Oculus for a minute. And the problem that I had is that you look to steer, but you can also move the mouse to steer. Right. And you would find yourself like sort of alternating between the two. Mm-hmm. And there's a point at which I was like sort of turned around halfway and looking up in order to move forward. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> and what that kind of told me is that either we need to fix like how the controls work for that, or it's going to have to be different types of experiences. Mm-hmm. Like for example, piloting something yeah. where you're seated in something and the chair is going to stay there, mm-hmm. and you move independently of where you're looking. Right. And and there's there are a couple answers to this. Some people have researched how to move in 3D spaces, and mm-hmm. the run and gun quake style game that's got some challenges ahead of it to figure out how can we do this. I'm not saying they can. I know that they can. Um, it's just got to figure out what the implementation has to look like. Right. Uh, so there's a number of ways you can deal with first-person motion. Uh, when like, Seated VR uh, in context. Uh, in seated VR, you can do uh, blink turning. You can say, whenever I hit the left button, I will just pop 90 degrees. And that actually is much more comfortable uh, than... Uh, 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 driving-based 
turning. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the problem with that is like your your inner ear freaks out because you start moving and you start feeling dizzy because uh, it's it's like you spun around a whole lot and you suddenly stop. You still feel like you're turning, even though you know you're not, and yeah. that makes you feel a little sick. And the same thing is true here. Your brain starts saying, "Oh, clearly I'm dizzy," mm. and it, your your inner ear locks up, and you get a headache from that, and that's what leads to a lot of nausea. Another another problem is acceleration. If you are moving suddenly forward, back, left, and right, and doing all these other motions with no clear impetus or or sense of center. Uh, that also freaks out your inner ear and you start feeling sick. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so a lot of research has gone into, like, what happens if you, like, render the bridge of your nose? Because, you know, you, most people don't realize it, and you know, they, they mm-hmm. blank it out in the blind spot. But, you know, if you pay attention to it now, you'll realize the bridge of your nose is visible in your eyesight. Uh, so people try to turn that on, and that helps a little bit. Um, what And I think a, a bigger interpretation of that is, is, like, having a point of reference, having some physical means, like, this is why I'm moving, something your brain can latch onto. It's like, oh, that's what's going on. Mm. Uh, lucky is that, the anchor for us. So he's like, oh, we're falling lucky. We're stuck with him. When he moves, we move. Um, this is why mech games and car games mm-hmm. are going to be fantastic. They're yeah. going to be first-person games because you'll be in the cockpit. Those oh, are some yeah. of the ones that I'm excited about yeah. because I'm, I'm a big fan of, of you know giant robots and yeah. mechs mm-hmm. and stuff, and I'd love to see something like a mech warrior. Yeah. In full VR. Yes. Mm-hmm. Eve Valkyrie is a good example of this. Yes. You are in a cockpit, mm-hmm. and as you're moving, you have your center. You know that you're moving because the cockpit's moving. Mm-hmm. And this is not a science yet. I mean, this is, we're at the point now, we're just trying stuff out. And this is pioneering. Yeah. We're yeah. in the pioneering oh, yeah. stage. Uh, and Leading so, edge. That's a huge thing there. <laughs> Another way that they handle it is point and click. Uh, rather than dealing with the actual locomotion, having a joystick or WASD movement, you know, you can... It's say you have a move controller or a touch controller or something, mm-hmm. or you know even a mouse. You can just move the mouse over and say, click on the ground. It does a ray cast. Says, this is where I need to be. Pop, teleport, you're there. And that actually oh, cool. removes the need for you to move. Hmm. And so another way they could do it, too, is sort of uh, uh, God's eye view and then player view. So you know, it's like you, you hit a button and you jump down into the cell and you, here you are in the space and this is a safe perspective and everything. And then when you're done, you hit go back to the map pops go to get the full map and you can say like we'll use world of warcraft as an example mm-hmm. like, i'm in the barrens now but let's go to stormwind you click stormwind it pops you down and that's how you handle movement so there's a number of ways to experiment with this and mm-hmm. all of them have advantages and disadvantages the vive is what makes things really interesting uh because that's room scale vr and the oculus can do room scale so it's, it's got a few more limitations in terms of, like what you can do in terms of the 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 frustrum of uh, the space you can handle it in uh, even PlayStation VR is going to have, uh, and this this is all public information too. I mean, mm-hmm. it's like uh, it's some forward facing motion and things like that. It's like you can get depth, and that's how it's doing working with that because it's it's a matter of how many cameras you have. And then there are other systems coming out. They're going to try to get in, uh, go even further with that. Uh, and so it's like you can have much larger spaces. But one of the challenges of that, however, is like who has a fifteen by fifteen foot space in their house that's completely empty and ready for them to do these things. Mm-hmm. We all do. No, oh, clearly. clearly. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, room scale solves a lot of things because mm-hmm. you don't have to worry about interpreting acceleration. You don't have to worry about turning left and right with a controller because you can just get up and walk around the space. Mm-hmm. And as long as you don't... like this is, this is actually one of the early challenges in VR, and this might go back to what you were saying, mm-hmm. uh, Adam. Um, when, you, like, Say if you play like Half-Life 2 in VR and you, you give it that walk impulse, or even if you... Yeah, yeah, give it that walking post. If you're going to suddenly be like running at uh, Gordon Freeman speed, yeah, even his walk is an all-out <laughs> run for most people, right? <laughs> right? And then his sprint is an insane. That is so jarring. So like you suddenly go like, oh god, <laughs> and then and then you hit sprint and you're like suddenly going like equivalent of like thirty or forty miles an hour. Like you're going full cheetah mode. <laughs> you feel like you're going to fall over. Not only that, but you're also seeing like this tunnel vision going on. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, and it actually creates a really weird ocular distortion. Even though it's not actually warping on the screen, it's like your brain just freaks out and it's like headache time. Uh, and that that ruined me actually for an entire day after trying that for a couple minutes. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, so so let me ask you this, Phil, because we've been we've been talking a lot about Lucky's Tales. Sure. But, um, could you be a little specific about your particular role on the project sure. and what you were brought in specifically to do, and then maybe yeah. how your role has evolved once you were brought in? Well, uh, I was brought in uh, very early on in the project. They already kind of knew what they wanted to make. Mm. Uh, and I, they brought me in to be a level designer to begin with. Um, for a while, it was uh, me and the CEO of the company were the designers, and then they brought in um, 
the guy who actually uh, put me in contact with Paul to begin with, and uh, he became the director of the project, and he and I worked together. And so, mostly what I ended up doing was, like, for the first, like, three weeks, I was just a level designer, and I was like, okay, white box, work with Unity, figure this out, stuff out, and build it out. Uh, but, you know, it, it is a small company, and everyone there is incredibly, incredibly talented, so it's not just about my role changing, but everyone's role Titles don't mean a whole lot. It's just a matter of like what discipline do you work in. So you have design, art, and code, uh, and then everyone functions within those pillars, just all over the place. And sometimes you bleed between other ones. It's like I wrote a few shaders for it. I, I did a few care. I, I did some work on the story. I did some work on, uh, you know, the menu systems. It's just it's all over the place. And so in order to like try to narrow it down and say here's what I did, I don't think I could do that any more than any single person on the team could do. I mean, it's very much a. Uh, team, I dare say family endeavor to build out this game. So how, it it's all over the board as far as whatever else. And you say it's a small company. How about how big is or how many people let's put it this way, what is the the size of the development team on Lucky's Tale? Team? The team itself flexed anywhere from six to fourteen people over the course of two mm-hmm. years. Average size was eight. So yeah, so that is a pretty small yeah, team. Yeah, we were it was real small. Everyone everyone did a little bit of everything. I mean we we had uh, our only engineer. He did some design work. Like he actually went through and did all the time trial flags towards the end of the game. Uh, and then I wrote a few scripts. And then we have artists who are you know uh, also doing animation, but also doing set dressing. And then we have uh, we had, we brought in one guy just to do the lighting because uh, switching to Unity Five is like oh god Unity Five the lighting so different. <laughs> uh, so that's why we added one more permanent guy. But uh, yeah, it's a very small team uh, right now. It's it's a, uh, the same team working on the next thing. We're still pretty small. Um, and then uh, the company, I think, is like 30 people now. Maybe, maybe, we're, maybe we're more than 35, but we, we grew a little bit. So so Lucky's Tale is it's specifically designed to be a launch title for the Oculus, yes. Oculus Rift, correct? Does it come with the Oculus Rift? Yes. Uh, in fact, I think every person who has an Oculus account gets it. Oh, well. So if okay. you have like a DK2, mm-hmm. you could play it. So, and when does it come out? It's out. It's out right now? Yeah, it's launched. Okay. We have reviews. Cool. Cool. Are they good? Yes. Good. <laughs> when when did it come out specifically? <laughs> oh, I don't know the launch day off the top of my head now. I think it's like March 18th. Uh, I personally don't have my my consumer rift yet. Like, they... So, I know, it, I know it's been kind of hard because they've had some issues with, like, shipping and all that. Mm-hmm. Uh, or... I don't know, maybe they're just that that far back ordered. I actually don't know any details, but I know that I, I'm still waiting on mine, and I'm supposed to have mine in August or something. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. I, I did wait till pretty late to order mine, though. For for reference, this is being recorded in uh, early May, so August is a, a way out. So Mid-May at this point. So, yeah, then, so then let me ask you this, then. So what are... What's next for Playful Corp? Like, what is... It, do you plan to make... Like, I mean, obviously you may not be able to give us specific. I, I can't speak for the studio, um, of course. But my general question would be, are y'all going to, just in general, are you going to continue to um, develop other VR games? Or are you looking at other VR projects that may not necessarily be video games? Holodecks? Or, not necessarily holodecks, but, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that could be done in VR that aren't necessarily gaming-related projects. So my question is, are y'all... Is Playful Corp sticking with... The games model, or are they considering going other directions, or is this a like, you know, can't tell you because this is all proprietary information, and uh, corporate secrets? If from only from the perspective of not wanting to misspeak, mm-hmm. I mean, we're not a. I wouldn't say we're a very secretive studio, but uh, just to avoid misspeaking, I would say it's in our name. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think games are are pretty much always 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 going to be yeah. part of our blood. You you can at least confirm that y'all are keeping busy. We'll say yes. <laughs> busy is very true. <laughs> if it was a boolean value, busy equals yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, is there is there anything uh, for those that that are listening that might um, be on the fence about picking up an Oculus Rift and might be thinking, hey. I'm not sure if this is for me. Um, my computer can run it, but I don't know if I necessarily need one. Is there something that you could you could say to them a, a reason why you think it's a good purchase? Well, you know, I'm 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 not here to say what VR a person should get into. Hmm. Mainly from the perspective of right now, VR is such a frontier technology. Hmm. We're all so excited about it. 
if someone's like trying to decide, I'm, I'm going to read into and project a little bit on your question. If someone's mm-hmm. trying to decide between like the Rift or the Vive or PSVR or uh, whatever Google Cardboard thing is going to come next, um, it's not about what you get right now. I think there are certain, you know, if, if there are certain games like Lucky's Tale being, you know, being an exclusive, I totally would say like if you want to play that game get a rift because right now it's the exclu- it's an exclusive for that title. Mm-hmm. And so if you're excited about that, that should that's my reason for you to get a rift. But if you're apprehensive about VR or if you want to know where it's going to be or is it a, is it a good purchase right now? There's no telling what the life cycle of one of these headsets is right now. I mean, I've heard a, I've heard a guess anywhere between, you know, a year to 2 years is the lifespan of a single headset. Mm-hmm. You know, like when's the next one come out? None of this is official. Isn't it? Mm-hmm. These are all open rumors now. Well, a bit like phones. Yeah. Really. So I was like, yeah. I, you know, it, it wouldn't be a secret. It's like I have no idea what right. the future. And, of and you also don't know, are. like, if the new headset comes out, it doesn't necessarily mean that you know Lucky's Tale wouldn't run on the new headset as well. I would assume. I would assume it might. That's that's more forward thinking than than I, I know about. Mm-hmm. But um, I think what it comes down to is like, if you're interested in VR and you have a way to do it particularly if you want to be part of this new platform. I mean, you're always going to see, like, you know, when new consoles like, you want to be part of the revolution and, (laughs) you know, buy the next Nintendo or buy, you know, buy this, buy that, buy that. Right now, VR is a little expensive. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. Gear VR notwithstanding, because you're kind of getting a phone with that, which... Mm -hmm. I guess it makes you. you know, and, it's a little bit of a subsidy on the cost, and it's also not as like the fidelity of it is not as good. Like I mean, I can tell yeah. putting it on, you we, can actually it, see some of the pixels, and it's just not as the screen door effect is going to be something that we're working on for a very long time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, and do your research on which headset you want if that's what you if you're going to get into it. I think from my part, there is no downside to getting into VR. Whether you do it mobile, mobile admittedly has a, a problem where it does not have positional tracking yet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I suspect they're going to have that salt before long. Uh, the Vive is, you know, it's good. It's a good headset. It's a good piece of hardware. Uh, the the Rift is a fantastic piece of hardware. Uh, PlayStation VR, I totally suspect, is going to be amazing. Um, it's going, you I know, mean, it's also going to be the cheapest. So, I mean, if someone's on the fence right now, I, mean, I, th- I think like so, the PSVR is going to be like it's like what four hundred dollars just for the headset, five hundred dollars. For a full kit, which includes two motion controllers, and then you get a PlayStation, and there's the rumors going around right now about like the PS4K or something like that. Yes. Um, so I mean, even that, even I assume I don't know what the price is going to be for that because I haven't even announced it, but I assume it's still a, well, it's still a rumor, but we'll see what happens at E3. Yeah, it's actually the price tag 4K. It's yeah. not the resolution. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, this is four thousand. It's four thousand dollar PlayStation. Um, but all to say, it's like you Solid know, gold choose, PlayStation. <laughs> choose what you want. But I think the onus is less on me telling you to get it, and more on just the state of the VR industry saying, "Like, here's why this exists." Because there is actually this big fear that. And, then, and I say I don't say fear; it's a bit uh, perception that VR ha- is running this risk of being a fad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I can say, from my perspective, having tried out as much VR as I can, it's not. Um, but I think it is on developers. And I say this as a person who just put out a uh, a full title. Uh, the demo scene is going to be alive and well for a very long time. And I think that's the thing that uh, will help drive sales the most: is developers need to create fully immersive, I believe I'm here, uh, experiences that go beyond the, the scope of what a gimmick, a gimmick or a demo is. That makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it's so easy to say, here's ping pong, and I have two tables, and that's it. That's not a product that's going to be attractive to most people. Right. Uh, because for that price, for the price point of entry, you just go buy a ping pong table for a lot less. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> kidding. And so I think, in what you get, you like... Like, if you get, like, a, a Final Fantasy, or if you get a, you know, if you get a really big blockbuster title in, 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 on a platform, that's an excellent start. I mean, Lucky's Tale, la- or sorry, L- yeah, Lucky's Tale launched on the Rift alongside uh, Eve Valkyrie, and that's a huge thing. It's like that, you get games with it, you get real games. Uh, the Vive has some fantastic titles, like, is it uh, Job Simulator, and 
it's not called Fantastic Contraption. It's uh, there's some there's a machine game and. If the Incredible could, Machine? Incredible Machine. Could, yeah. Let's back up here a second. Job Simulator? Jo- yeah, Job Simulator is a game. It's it's kind of goofy. You, you can uh, you can get you like uh, you use the uh, the Vive controllers. You can grab objects in your cubicle, and you grab like a donut and put it on like the copy machine. Hit copy, and the donut pops out. If you put your huh. face on the scanner, you think you put your face up. A little brain pops out. Uh, it's got a, it's just a cute little thing. And then Surgeon Simulator also. Mm. And so the simulators are going to be huge on these things, right? Um, so there's a lot of a lot of interesting titles coming out, but the momentum has to increase, the quality has to increase. We have to keep pushing hard because uh, the in the next year, two years, that's what's really going to make VR. It might take and and, and internally, uh, you know, in terms of the community, I mean, uh, for VR, we're we're all prepared to like it could take five years before it really hits mainstream. I personally think it's going to go a lot faster. I think, you know, I think we're, uh, you know, all very excited to see it take off and do amazing things. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's some hurdles to that because, you know, like uh, if the things you want to do are harder to do in VR because it's like uh, if you want to get like graphics that match what you see in like Doom, uh, the, yeah, the new Doom that mm-hmm. came out like Friday, you're going to need a much stronger computer to do that in VR. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so I do have, um, this is the question that, that might be on everyone's mind that we're just not saying, but when is the, um, the Oculus Rift uh, light cycle game going to come out? <laughs> I'm sure I know I was I'm, thinking it. Yeah. I'm sure someone's working on it. <laughs> Uh, personally, I, I, I think the uh, uh, the disc game is going to come. The disc, first. the disc. Oh, will come. that yeah, makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. I just want Parisi Squares. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. That yeah, would actually be pretty. That's cool. that's from uh, the Star Trek the start, yes. Generation. Yeah, it was yeah. never actually shown mm-hmm. um, because it was so incredibly violent. Every scene, somebody's got you know, like a broken arm or mm-hmm. a scar, or bleeding or something. So they never showed the yeah. game. I just always assumed that the uh, the crew of the, of, uh, the Enterprise was just very um, clumsy. Well, that's probably true, actually. I'm looking forward to a really good boxing game. Mm. Oh. And actually, what I'm... And I say boxing game because I, I, it's going to be funny because you're going to see people punching white walls all the time. You just like, hear a bunch of fist holes well, in people's walls. Is there going to be feedback where the uh, the uh, the entire riff vibrates? Is there vibration? Vib- Not in the headset, no. Okay. no. Like, like you get your pun- head when you get punched? Yeah, you get punched in the face, it vibrates, and you're like, whoa. Well, that's no. a really good question, actually, with the biofeedback. Uh, biofeedback is going to be important moving forward. Isn't it? I don't mm. think I, I know people are working on it. There's like you can get like a vest and everything, but they already had that for regular PC gaming. Yeah, that's true. That's in, true. Impact yeah. vests where like you, know, you get hit and it like fires off a little like motor. Mm-hmm. Get one of the super chairs. Yeah. Say? Well, I know the the military has used uh, things like that simulations yeah. where they they have the people wear uh, the full outfit so that they can feel like a bullet hit them in the chest or something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wearing yeah. a full VR, they're in whole like. A, it's very very interesting. There's been a lot of, and I think, uh, which I know we're, we're nearing the end of our time here, but mm-hmm. just a, a question about other applications for VR aside from just um, gaming. I'm looking specifically at, at industries like, um, I guess the big three would be um, the military, um, the, um, uh, I'm blanking on it right now, uh, but military, education, mm-hmm. and uh, medical. Yep. So would you say that any of these are, are more likely to sort of push um, innovation, or do you think it's going to be kind of in all three directions at once? Um, I think a really important thing to keep in mind is, like, the, the trajectory that VR has had the last 20 years. VR has effectively only lived in those spheres you just, mm. you just listed out. Gaming VR was just not a thing. Um, it's true, yeah. yeah. And it wasn't until gamers came along and you know Palmer Lucky says, "Hey, we can do this and set this for games," and builds it out based on you know the, the work he'd done and, and what he already knew. So, will that accelerate? I think yes at this point, but I think that consumer electronics are going to be where you're going to see a vast majority of the uh, advancements that are going to be relevant to that population mm-hmm. um, because you know before the oculus rift a headset costs five thousand dollars a piece right. wasn't that good and was prone to breaking and i think the same thing's gonna be true of like as we as we start moving towards and like you know we want to have extra sensory uh perceptions so it's like you know you want that impact vest or if you want smell vision or if you want um you know advances in that audio techno audio processing technology to make it sound like you're really there with like uh with bi- uh, binaural 
audio or things like that. I think you're going to see a lot of those advancements from the consumer end first, or at least even if they are, they're happening there, they might inspire, but that technology probably won't directly go into consumers. And, that, and that, that's just me looking at 20 years of technology. Mm-hmm. It may be different now, now that everyone's like, oh my God, we can do this on the cheap. We just use these pieces that, and just put them together in more interesting ways rather than trying to focus on, we have this incredibly complex piece of technology that's a piece of crap, and we're going to just make it ch- cost $5,000. Because that's the, that's the beauty of the Rift. The Rift, uh, the, the Vive, all these things, they're expensive because they have a lot of new technology in them. But but if you take individual pieces, there's a lot of stuff. There's like a lot of like, hey, this already existed in cell phones. And so let's see if we can bring it together and make something awesome out of it. And so that worked out. Like, you know, screens, gyroscopes, and lenses. Those things already existed. Mm-hmm. And it's putting those together in the right way helped get us to where we are now in terms of gaming VR. So if it if it encourages a new a new sprint of innovation, awesome. But I'm gonna I'm gonna just put it out there. I think consumer electronics are gonna be the driving force for a little bit. Cool. Um, all right. Well, um, Phil, I just want to thank you for coming out and uh, yeah, giving, awesome. sharing awesome your talk. thoughts. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of really great information. I thought just about VR in general and things that I had personally hadn't really thought of or given a ton of thought to. Um, Lucky's Tale definitely sounds like a, an interesting experience. I'm might take me a little bit before I feel like I can I can make the leap and, and afford to get a Rift, but it's probably it's something that I'm definitely looking at. I'll yeah, say between that, that and yeah. Valkyrie, I definitely think I want to get a Rift now. It's yeah, I, I I I will go so far as to say that I think independent of those games, mm-hmm. and I will say I think Lucky's Tale is one of the best games that you can possibly get in VR. And I say that as a person who made it, but also just as a gamer, mm-hmm. because it, it's just, it, it, it really is, I think, one of the best games you can get. But um, VR in general, no matter which headset you end up getting, or like you said, you already have the Gear VR, so you already kind of have your, your toes deep in there. As far as VR goes, everyone who's working in VR professionally, we're all friends right now because we all want it to succeed. And so mm-hmm. I think it comes down to get what's best for you as long as you get in it. What a cool mm-hmm. way to be working. Neat. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, that's that yeah. makes a lot of, lot of sense actually. Mm-hmm. If, if only other industries could could oh, do so well. Well, well you right? know, in five years we'll all be cutthroat. But right now <laughs> we just we want this this industry to succeed and be amazing. Hey, welcome to America. That's great. <laughs> I, I really want to play Lucky Still. I'm looking forward to uh, to playing it. So um, I know you you gave me an invitation to, to come play it. I need to take you up on it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, very cool. Then we'll uh, report on it on the podcast. Sure. As a button mush. Does it <laughs> cool. count? Does it have buttons? I don't know. <laughs> it there counts. Are you you play with the game pads. So yeah, it counts. There vir- are virtual mush. <laughs> virtual mush. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll have to come up with a new segment for VR. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for episode 65 of the backward compatible.com podcast, our talk on VR. Uh, I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. Bye. And that's Phil. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next time. We want to join your discussion because dialogue makes everyone better. Want to hear our thoughts on a particular game or topic? Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, or at our website, backward-compatible.com. And we might feature your question on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Compatible.